DOS. For many, the mere utterance of this three-letter acronym brings back memories of a simpler time, when programs were loaded from floppy disk and games had no DLC. A time spanning the late 70s through the mid-90s, when your computer was offline and the white text on black background shrouded the computer in a type of mystery, inviting you to learn more to uncover the possibilities of your machine. And yet, many of you have probably only heard of DOS. If you were born in the 90s, you may only have ever seen DOS, maybe at a travel agent's, whilst mom and dad argued over which hotel to pick, or in a movie you vaguely remember. Wow. What? We got something. We're in. Today, we're going to have a look at DOS, its history, the reason it existed, which companies sold it, and what it eventually led to, as well as modern versions of DOS you can still use till today. We'll be taking Microsoft DOS 6.22 for a spin, the last official version of DOS, to see whether there's anything useful we can do with it. But before all that, what does DOS even mean? The name DOS stands for Disk Operating System. And strictly speaking, no operating system ever made has just been called DOS. Uh, rather, disk operating system refers to an operating system which is stored on disks, uh, be they floppy disks, hard disks, or optical disks. Now you may be wondering, where else would an operating system be stored if not on a disk? Early computers didn't really have an onboard user accessible storage device. Uh, instead, programs and data were fed into the computer using punched cards, punched tape, magnetic tape, and magnetic drums. Early home computers didn't technically have an operating system. Instructions were typically given to the computer using a front panel, such as in this Altair 8800. Later, home computers would have an operating system installed on a ROM chip, that's read-only memory. Uh, which typically handled the basic functionality of the computer and provided a programming environment such as BASIC. On an early home computer, such as the Commodore 64, released in 1982, booting up the system would present a BASIC prompt. Uh, you could then write and run your own programs or load programs from a magnetic tape. By the early 60s, disk drives started becoming more affordable, especially for mainframes used by business and education. Operating systems were created to take advantage of the capabilities offered by the drives. And this is where disk operating systems were born. Early examples of DOS include DOS 360, used by IBM mainframes starting in 1964. Also, Apple DOS, developed by Apple and Shepherds and Microsystems and used in the Apple II starting in 1978. And also, Atari DOS in 1979. For many computers, DOS was an add-on to an existing operating system used to handle disk drives. Uh, this was stored in ROM or on an external disk, as was the case in the Commodore 64 and 128, which stored their Commodore DOS on ROM chips inside an external disk drive, often costing as much as the computer itself. Later operating systems, especially those created in the early to mid-80s, stored the operating system itself on disk. So now we have an idea of where the name DOS actually comes from. But when talking DOS, most people think of one particular series of DOS versions, those from Microsoft. In 1980, IBM was working on an upcoming product known as the IBM Personal Computer, or PC for short, which would later revolutionize the entire computing industry and directly result in you watching this video on your computer or phone today. IBM had built the system from almost exclusively off-the-shelf components in an effort to reduce development time and costs. The hardware was almost done, but they needed an operating system to power it, including its disk drive support. 
IBM approached Bill Gates, who in turn suggested that IBM should contact Digital Research Incorporated to license an upcoming version of their CPM operating system. Now you might be wondering, CPM, I've never heard of it, what is that? CPM was an operating system developed by Gary Kildall at Digital Research Incorporated. Before IBM and PC-DOS, CPM was the go-to operating system, designed to run on Intel 8080 and 8085 line of CPUs. Released in 1974, CPM quickly soared in popularity, and many thought that CPM would be the operating system of choice as processors switched from 8 to 16-bit. Now, IBM's PC was based on the Intel 8088 processor, which is basically a cost-reduced version of Intel's 8086 processor. At the same time, Digital Research was working on a version of CPM called CPM86, which, you guessed it, was designed to run on the 8086 processor. The timing would have been perfect for Digital Research, uh, but unfortunately the deal never materialized. Uh, honestly, there's more than another video's worth of content to say about CPM and digital research, but we'll leave that for another day. With the deal with digital research not happening, IBM went back to Bill Gates to provide an operating system. Microsoft in turn approached Seattle Computer Products. There, programmer Tim Patterson had developed a variant of CPM80 known as QDOS, the Quick and Dirty Operating System which was intended to be used internally by Seattle Computer Products for testing. Later, the system was renamed to 86DOS and sold commercially. Microsoft purchased 86DOS for a rumored $50,000, which is about $143,000 in 2021 money. They rebranded it to MS-DOS and started licensing it to IBM and other computer manufacturers starting in 1981. Microsoft would later require all licensees to use the MS-DOS name, except for IBM, which distributed their version as IBM PC-DOS. For a while, IBM offered PC customers the choice of either PC-DOS or CPM86. But as CPM86 cost $200 more than PC-DOS, which is about $575 in today's money, it quickly faded and MS-DOS and PC-DOS quickly became the operating systems du jour, riding on the success of the IBM PC and its many clones. Microsoft initially only sold DOS to OEMs, Original Equipment Manufacturers, companies like IBM, Compaq, Dell and dozens of others who would bundle DOS with their computers. DOS contained all device driver code in a file called io.sys, when OEMs purchased a DOS license, they would also receive an OEM Adaptation Kit, known as OAK for short, which they would use to customize IO.sys with the drivers needed for their system. This was primarily since not all PCs at the time were 100% IBM compatible. By the early 90s though, most PCs were IBM compatible, also known as IBM clones. This meant that the same drivers could be shipped on most computers, so Microsoft took this opportunity to start selling MS-DOS version 5 in 1991. We're introducing something new. It's essential for all, the many and the few. It's in your store. Ooh, Microsoft Vansu. The MS-DOS 5 upgrade is a hit, and no PC should be without it. No PC should be without it. Okay, adverts in the 90s, okay, I mean. Uh, it down. The success of MS-DOS can almost be called coincidental. Gordon Letwin, one of the initial 11 Microsoft employees, said in a 1995 post on the comp.os.msWindows.misc newsgroup, DOS was, when we first wrote it, a one-time throwaway product intended to keep IBM happy so that they'd buy our languages. Nevertheless, Microsoft kept improving DOS, and many concepts introduced in this operating system are still found in systems we use today, especially Microsoft Windows. MS-DOS and many others like it are single-user, single-task operating systems. When you load DOS, you don't log in, since the system is intended to be used by one user, whoever happens to be at the computer at the time. 
Being a single task system means that you can only typically run one user-facing application at a time. Although some exceptions are present in later versions of DOS, thanks to TSR, that's Terminate and Stay Resident applications. Of course, being a disk operating system, DOS has support for disks. Each of the drives attached to a system is given a drive letter, a practice that persists in Microsoft Windows to this day. The disks in early computers were typically floppy disks, such as five and a quarter inch floppy disks and their associated drives. As a side note, these disks were actually quite bendy and flimsy, which is where the floppy in floppy disk comes from. As your floppy disk was the main disk in your system, drive A was reserved for it. As the price of floppy disk drives decreased, and as computers transitioned from five and a quarter inch to three and a half inch drives, it was common for computers to have two floppy disk drives, drives A and B. This started the practice, still in use to this day, of having the first hard disk labeled C. MS-DOS used the File Allocation Table, or FAT, file system on these disks. Originally, FAT12, because it was 12-bit, later versions of DOS supported FAT16, with a maximum drive size of 32 megabytes. Culminating in MS-DOS 7.1, which supported FAT32, with maximum drive sizes of 137 gigs. Although MS-DOS 7 was only ever shipped with Windows, and never sold as a standalone product. DOS had a file name structure known as 8.3, a maximum file name length of 8 characters, with 3 characters reserved for the file extension. Notably, this 8.3 format was even used in the first versions of Windows, up to and including Windows 3.1. Although we've thankfully passed the 8.3 file name limit era, FAT lives on today. Windows, macOS and Linux can all read FAT formatted drives and all offer the option of creating a FAT32 file system on devices such as external media. In 2006, Microsoft even released XFAT, an extensible file allocation table intended for external storage drives where NTFS is not feasible. XFAT supports large file sizes and single file sizes greater than 4 GB, a notable limitation of FAT32. Famously, MS-DOS only supported 640k of RAM, at least initially. Remember that DOS was originally designed for the Intel 8086 processor, with a maximum of 1 megabyte of RAM. However, 384 kilobytes of that megabyte, known as upper memory, are reserved, leaving the system with a total of 640k of so-called conventional memory. A quote famously misattributed to Bill Gates is that 640K ought to be enough for anybody, something Gates supposedly said in 1981 with the release of the original IBM PC. Now, for one, there is very little evidence that Gates actually said that, and Gates himself has denied saying it a number of times. Now, even if Gates had said it, it would not have been so untrue at the time. Remember, the Commodore 64, a hugely popular computer released a year later, in 1982, could only access 64K of memory, so 640K was an order of magnitude larger. Later extensions to DOS, such as Expanded Memory Specification, that's EMS, and Extended Memory Specification, that's XMS, allowed DOS to access more RAM. As early as 1985, IBM and Microsoft had started to realize that a replacement for DOS would be needed. This was down to three things. First, DOS only supported up to 640K of memory, at least initially, and it was fast becoming apparent that modern applications would need more than that. Secondly, AT&T had been licensing Unix to educational institutions since 1975, and the popularity of the system, mostly due to its superiority to DOS in almost every way, was leading some OEMs to choose Unix. Finally, other operating systems, notably the Apple Macintosh, had a graphical user interface, whilst DOS was still mostly text-based. To this end, two projects were started. IBM and Microsoft signed a joint development agreement in August 1985 to start working on a new operating system called OS2, named so because it was introduced with IBM's Personal System 2, or PS2, line of machines. 
want to start small, but think tall. That's your plan with computers that can go along with you. How are you going to do it? Well, you're going to PS2 it with the IBM PS2. Knowing that OS2 would be sold exclusively through IBM channels, Microsoft had also started working on another operating system based on DOS, Microsoft Windows. Windows 1.0 was released in November 1985 and ran on top of MS-DOS. OS2 1.0 was released in December 1987, coincidentally, or perhaps not, the same month that Windows 2 was released. In 1990, Microsoft released Windows 3, which signaled the beginning of the end of the IBM and Microsoft partnership, which always stood on shaky ground. IBM had always intended OS2 to be an operating system for IBM hardware, sold exclusively by IBM as an add-on product. Microsoft, on the other hand, intended Windows to be a mass-market operating system, working on different hardware configurations and bundled with many computers of the time. This difference in culture, as well as the fact that Windows 3 was a huge success, selling millions of copies in 1990, led to the two giants splitting up their efforts. Microsoft would keep developing Windows, whilst IBM would keep working on OS2. Now, as a result of this divorce, development of DOS was also divided. MS-DOS 6.2.2, released in 1993, was the last commercial, standalone release of MS-DOS with future versions being incorporated into Windows, starting with Windows 95. IBM released its last retail version of PC-DOS, called PC-DOS 2000, in 1998. Although not released as standalone software, both major DOS releases lived on for several more years. Windows 95, 98 and ME all included MS-DOS, with 95 and 98 booting from a DOS prompt, and ME allowing DOS to be used once Windows was loaded, albeit not in real mode. The final release of this version of DOS, MS-DOS 7.1, was in 1999. On the IBM side, following PC-DOS 2000, other versions of PC-DOS were used in IBM products, as well as some third-party products, all the way until 2003 with PC-DOS 7.1. Whilst neither MS-DOS nor PC-DOS have been sold commercially for almost 20 years, remember that DOS is a category of operating systems, not just the IBM and Microsoft ones. For example, after Microsoft announced it would no longer sell or support DOS in June 1994, student Jim Hall announced and started working on FreeDOS, a public domain replacement to DOS which would aim to have 100% compatibility. FreeDOS is still available today, with the latest stable version at the time of this video being 1.2, released in December 2016, with version 1.3 in development. DOSBox is an increasingly interesting project, providing an emulated DOS environment for running DOS games, which was started in January 2002. This was spurred by the release of Windows 2000 and later Windows XP, which did not have support for real DOS mode meaning many old DOS games would not run on these systems. Although primarily intended for gaming, DOSBox can run a wealth of DOS software, not just on Windows, but on Mac OS and Linux too. The latest version of DOSBox at the time of this video is 0.74, which was released in June 2019. Okay, so here we are on my desktop, and I'm going to open VirtualBox to create a virtual machine to host DOS. Uh, so I'll click New, and I'll call this guy MS-DOS. All right, uh, let's see, RAM is fine. And yeah, we'll create a virtual hard disk. Okay, we're creating a disk of 500 megs, which is more than enough. Okay, so we'll now go to the settings. Uh, we'll go to storage and we will insert disk one of the MS-DOS installation. Now, I'm doing it the long way here. Uh, there's a quicker way to do it, which I'll show you later on. Okay, so disk one and open, choose, and we'll click OK. So our system is ready to boot now. 
Okay, so that's a very, very small box on my 4K display. Uh, let's see if we can fix that. Uh, nope, that doesn't work. Uh, I'll try scaling it. Okay, that's a bit better. And yeah, that makes it clearer. Okay, so uh, we'll configure the disk space. Setup will restart your computer now. Okay. Okay, date and time is fine. Country is United States. Uh, let's set that to Malta. And yeah, I was half expecting this. Malta isn't there, not to mention many other countries. So I guess we'll leave it to United States. These settings are correct and it will install in the DOS folder. That's fine. Insert disk two. Okay, so now we have to swap our image to disk two. Again, I'm doing it the long way here, but I'll be showing you a quicker way of doing this very soon. But for now, we'll choose the disk two image. Now it is there. And continue with setup. Now for disk three. Okay, remove all disks and press enter. That's what we'll do. Okay, so we can now restart the system. And we're in MS-DOS. And as you can see, we have extended memory since we have more than 640K of RAM. So we'll type mem. And as you can see, it's detected 32 megabytes of RAM. Uh, and it's using XMS extended memory specification. So that's all good. We can use the dir command to look at the contents of the drive. And to clear the screen, we can use the cls command, which stands for clear screen, obviously. Okay, so now let's run scan disk, just to run a program. And it's finished testing and found no problems. Do you want to perform a surface scan? Yeah, why not? Now, obviously this would normally take forever um, on a hard disk of the time, but since we're using a virtual machine here on a modern system, this is actually going on quite quickly. Okay, so that's done and it didn't find any problems. Let's now get some software installed. Uh, so one of the most popular pieces of software at the time was WordPerfect 5. Uh, so we'll get WordPerfect installed and see what a word processor looked like in the 80s. Okay, so we'll go to our floppy, we'll type dirt, <laughs> realize it's a mistake and type there, and we'll run the installation. So welcome to the installation program. Yes, we do have a color monitor and we get some glorious colors there, installing to a hard disk and we'll choose a basic installation. Okay, so we're now being asked to insert another disk. Now we can just click on this floppy disk icon down here and choose a disk image straight away. So this is the quick way of getting a disk image loaded into VirtualBox. So we'll carry on with the installation. Okay, and we'll also add WordPerfect to autoexec.bat. So this will allow us to run WordPerfect wherever we are in the system. Okay, so WordPerfect should have been installed. Uh, we'll now restart the system, so the changes in autoexec.bat will be applied. Okay, so we can now type WP and here we are. We are inside WordPerfect. There's not much to see here. It's an empty page showing us the document number, page number and line number. Remember, people were coming to this from typewriters, so a hugely complicated interface wouldn't have been helpful. That being said, it doesn't really help me because I have no idea how to do stuff. So here I am checking the manual. WordPerfect actually came with an overlay which you'd insert on your keyboard and that would tell you what each function key would do. Some gems in the manual include this part here. Setting up WordPerfect is like setting a clean sheet of paper in a typewriter. So as you can see, you can see what this was aimed for. Anyway, so apparently, according to this manual, pressing F6 activates bold text. So let's try that out. So let's try some bold text. Okay, all right. Well, I was wondering how they would show that. And yeah, as you can see, it's clearly 
bold. We can bring up the main menu by pressing equals. As you can see, that brings up a drop-down menu, much like you'd see in a modern app, um, with all of the sections showing all of the functions of the program. We can even insert graphics, tables, equations, and so on. So let's try to insert a table. Okay, so we'll go to layout and tables and create. Number of columns, we'll leave that at three. Number of rows, five. And here we are in table edit mode. So this would allow us to resize columns, resize rows, add more rows and so on. Now to actually type text in the table, we have to press F10 to go back into normal text entry mode. And now I should be able to start typing text in the table. MS-DOS came with a built-in programming language called QBasic, that's Quick Basic. Um, now, this is not a programming tutorial, but we can type a simple two-line program to show a little bit how this worked. So, uh, we'll say print tech guru here. And then in the second line, we'll just say go to 10. So, this would create an infinite loop which prints out tech guru, as you can see here. To stop the program running, I can use the break key. Besides the three setup disks, DOS also came with a supplementary disk containing additional utilities. You can see here I'm viewing the contents of the disk. Now one of the things I'm interested in from here is DOS shell, which was a graphical, with a loose definition of the word, way to manage your files in DOS. To get it installed, I need to run the installation program. So I'll run setup, and apparently I did that wrong. So it needs setup, a drive, and a path. Okay, so setup, c colon slash ms dos, I guess. All right, what do you want to install? Now let's go ahead and install everything. You want to create it? Yes. Choose my monitor type. Uh, I'll choose VGA. Okay, so that should have been installed. So uh, let's go ahead and install mouse support. Now I found this on some shady website, so I hope this works. So this should allow us to use mice and CDs in DOS. So we'll restart the computer. Okay, so yeah, that, that looks like it's enabled CD support. And however, we have a problem here. The XMS driver, hymem.sys, is not loaded. All right, so this program must have messed up my config.sys file. Uh, let's edit it to see what's wrong. Ah, well, there you go. It says device equals hymen.sys, which, yeah, that's something totally different. <laughs> so let's change that to hymen.sys. Uh, as you can see, though, mouse support is working. Okay, uh, so we'll save this file and then restart the system to get high memory back. Okie dokie, so we should now have mouse support. Uh, now let's install some games. So I'm going to install Doom. We'll install to C colon. Insert the second disk and insert the first disk again. Okay, so now we can configure Doom. I'm going to use keyboard and mouse, although a mouse is totally unrequired to play Doom. Uh, I'm going to choose Sound Blaster to play music and sound, although to be fair, only the sound effects will work here, since I don't have proper MIDI emulation. Save settings and run Doom. There we are. Okay, so new game. I'll choose my difficulty level. And here I am playing Doom in DOS. Okay, so as you can see, this was quite a contrast, you know. Uh, one second you're running black, black background with white text, and next you're in a 3D environment, you know, killing demons. You can probably see why Doom was so popular at the time. It also carries on my theme of apparently playing Doom in every video I make on this channel.
Okay, so you see that guy up there. So without a mouse, you might be wondering how you would aim at the guy. Well, you don't need to. Uh, the game actually aims for you. You just have to point your gun roughly in the direction of the enemy. Okay, so we'll uh, kill this last demon here and head for the exit. Since I'm not trying to get 100% completion. And there we are. First level of the shareware version of Doom finished. And let's go ahead and quit Doom to get back to DOS. Now one thing you could do on DOS is write batch files. So this is basically a file containing commands you'd normally type in DOS, which would be run all at once when you run the file. So again, this is just a very, very basic example. Let's say we want to build a batch file that backs up Doom to another folder on our disk. So we'll display backing up Doom to the disk, and then we'll use the xcopy program to copy an entire folder from one place to another. And when that's done, we'll say backup complete. Okay, so we'll save this file and then run it. And there we are. The batch file runs and it should create a backup of my Doom installation in another folder. And as you can see, there it is, the Doom back directory. Now, one thing you may have noticed is that there's no auto completion. Pressing tab or up and down doesn't go to previous commands. But there is this DOSKey program, which as you can see, when I press up, I can see my previous commands. There's still no auto completion though. Now, one last thing I want to show you is DOS Shell. Uh, so this is a graphical sort of uh, utility to manage the files and programs in your computer. So as you can see, I have a directory tree on the left and a list of files in that directory on the right. And those of you who've used early versions of Windows might see that this is actually quite similar to what you'd see in Windows. Uh, I can even drag and drop files from one place to another. And uh, I can expand the contents of folders. As you can see up here, there's a menu where I can do quite a few things, including changing the view. And for example, this folder has a subfolder. See, I can expand it like that. And yeah, let's open an editor. So again, it asks me for the file name. So uh, I'll give it autoexec.bat. And there we are. And after I've made my changes, I can simply quit the editor and return back to the shell. Let's look at disk utilities. I'm curious as to what's in there. So disk utilities, huh, Microsoft antivirus. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so I guess detect and clean. You'll notice I actually have a mouse pointer here and no virus is found. Well, that's a relief. And let's see, I'll exit and press a key and return back to the DOS shell. So there you have it, a short overview of the history of DOS, an operating system with origins in the 60s, major releases from IBM and Microsoft spanning over 15 years, and modern variants such as FreeDOS still in use today. There's a lot more to say about DOS, but I hope I've given you a good overview as to what DOS was especially if you've never used it yourself. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if there's any other topics you would like me to cover in this mini documentary format, whether DOS or otherwise, let me know in the, down in the comments below. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please consider giving this video a like and this channel a subscribe. The channel is brand new, so your support really means a lot to me. I'll catch you in the next one, and until then, thanks for watching.